Welcome. Welcome, Welcome to, to church. church. Welcome to 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 church. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to our church live stream this morning um, from our living room to your living room. We really hope you're doing well this morning. Um, I just love Sundays. I love to the fact that we can connect with one another, even though it's not quite as we'd wish. Um, but even still, we, we have this opportunity. And, um, and we love it. We love it when you get in touch with us. So this morning, um, if it's your first time, there's a text number here in the top corner of the screen. You can send us a message. Um, let us know if it's your first time or your umpteenth time. Um, but also, if God's putting something on your heart this morning, or a, a prayer, or something you want us to pray into in the service, um, or possibly something you want us to pray for you specifically later on, um, or, or something that you feel is just for the church this morning, please do message us. Um, whatever it is, we'd love, it. We'd love to hear that. Um, also, here's uh, giving you notice, we are doing communion uh, this morning, so that might come as a surprise. So now is the time for that frantic rush around, um, and you can go and find um, some bread or some wine or some appropriate uh, substitutes um, that you've got in your kitchen, and, um, and then you can be ready for that later on in the service. Um, also, um, thank you to all of you who shared the Ashford Blessing video. Um, it, it's been viewed like over seven and a half thousand times just on our kind of channels on Facebook and YouTube, but then so many other times on all the churches over Ashford and it has been such an encouragement and a blessing to people. And so um, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, obviously go to our YouTube's the easiest place to find it and you'll see it. It'll come up probably in the recommended videos from this, I'm sure. Um, and also, um, we are really pleased this morning that Ron is going to do our call to worship. He's going to lead us into worship. So um, we're going to go over to Ron now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. It's the Lord's Day. And I'm going to read a couple of verses from a psalm which tell us that. It's headed... A song to sing on the Lord's day. It is good to say thank you to the Lord, to sing praises to the God who is above all gods. Every morning tell him thank you for your kindness, and every evening rejoice in all his faithfulness. Sing his praises accompanied by music from the lyre, from the harp and lute. You have done so much for me, O Lord. No wonder I am glad. I sing for joy. May we have that real note of worship and joy as we come before him uh, this morning uh, to worship him. Let me just say a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that this day you would reach out and touch each of our hearts. We thank you that we can come to you in the morning and sing of your goodness. We can come to you in the evening and talk of your faithfulness. We thank you that you are the God who has promised that you will be with us wherever we are. And we give you thanks this day. We're really going to meet with you 
in our homes uh, of this day and worship you from our hearts. We praise you. We bless you, our sovereign God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. We say amen. Amen. And Ron's one of our elders in the church, and it's just great um, that he was able to um, record that for us this morning. And um, Ben has also messaged in uh, a verse from Psalm 37, verse 26, which says this. It says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. And I just felt as I read that, Maybe there's someone this morning who really needs to know that God's going to direct your path and that he does delight in you. And you might feel like you've stumbled, but you won't fall because God's got you. He's got hold of you. He's holding you by the hand this morning. And, and so I pray you just know his presence as you worship him this morning. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings he shakes the whole earth with holy thunder he leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for that you've done for me Who brings us chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory The King of glory Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of his grace the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be saved. you've done for me yes we sing of all you've done for us Lord Jesus worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, Lord. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be saved. you've done for me yes we sing of all you've done Lord Jesus we thank you for all you've done you've lavished your grace upon us great is your faithfulness Lord Jesus thank you Lord I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies Hallelujah 
young Louder than the unbelief Raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody you now you might want to just raise a hallelujah to God whatever you're going through whatever the mystery is in your life at this time whatever rejoicing you're experiencing whatever mourning you're experiencing whatever battles you may face let's just praise God in the midst of it let's praise God and lift up his name the name of Jesus because Jesus has the victory Lord we praise you hallelujah thank you Lord Yes, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you reign, God. Lord, whatever we face, you reign. Lord, whatever we're going through, you reign, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, you never leave, you never forsake us. You're the God who's with us. You are Emmanuel, Holy Spirit, you fill us. And Lord, I pray that you would empower your people this morning. And as we praise you, God, I pray that we will see the darkness flee in our lives, Lord Jesus. As we praise you, God, I pray we will know the comfort of our merciful, loving Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And this morning, I really want us just to pray just for a couple of things. You know, if you don't join us for prayer, we pray every morning at 8 o'clock as a church gathered, um, let alone other prayer that's going on across church life. And and many of us gathered on Thursday evening to pray. And one of the things we let those who gathered then know, and and there'll be some who won't know this this morning, but Alan, who we've been praying for, um, Alan passed away last week. And we just want to lift up Stella this morning and stand with her and, um, and ask God just to fill her with comfort. So I just ask you, where you are, could you just lift your voice? And you might not know who we're talking about. We don't use surnames deliberately on the live stream, but you can still pray for them. Uh, let's just lift them up to God this morning and ask for the comfort of our Father to flood Stella's life and the whole family. Let's lift them up together. Thank you, Lord.
Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and fill Stella, fill her home this morning. Be with her, God. Father, wrap the arms of love around her. Thank you that underneath her are your everlasting arms which never fail and will uphold her and will carry her through this time and through the storm. And God, we thank you for Alan. We thank you for his faith. We thank you for the many stories that we have heard of how he's blessed so many and the example that he is. And God, I pray, um, Lord, help us to be inspired by him to persevere um, through trials that we face too, God. Thank you that he's with you, Lord. And, and we just also, we want to pray for anybody who is mourning at this time. And, and specifically, um, also I want us to pray for those who are unwell and in the final stages of life. And, and again, we've, we've got more people in our church family who are in that position. Um, so Michael and Dell, who some of you will know, who are actually in the same care home. And um, they're coming into potentially that last phase of life, um, although it's, it's never certain, is it? But we want to just lift them up to God this morning and their families to the Lord and pray for Charmian and Linda and Wendy. Let's just um, let's lift them up to God together again. And those who you know who are going through um, similar things this morning. Let's pray for them. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you. You're a God of comfort. You're the God of all comfort. You help us to comfort those who are in need with the same comfort that we've received from God. That's what your word says. And God, we pray that your comfort would be poured out this morning. That uh, We pray for that peace that passes all understanding, which we're going to be um, talking about later. Father, would it fill um, these families, Father, who we lift up to you now. And God, would it surround um that care home and all the staff and all those who are working there and all the residents, Lord God, and especially Michael and Dell at this time. I pray they know the peace of God like they've never known it before in their whole lives as they prepare to be with you, Father God. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And we know we live in a world that is... um, that is reeling and that is in pain and that is groaning and and Romans 8 speaks of this the whole creation is groaning and is longing uh, for the children of God to be revealed so that it can be liberated from its bondage to decay and we want to lift our world to God and we know the injustice that we've seen um, in the in the states but we know the injustice that's in our society too and the injustice that's in our hearts we know the evils of uh, discrimination and racism that have really come to the fore in the kind of the public agenda and 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 we want to pray that this really is a time of, of real and lasting change and breakthrough. And, and we want to pray that for ourselves and our church and our brothers and sisters too. And stand alongside those who are really hurting and who are, who are really feeling um, it at the moment. And who understand what that discrimination is like and who understand um, what it is like to, to live with injustice um, in a way that we just don't. Um, but we stand with them this morning. And let's, let's pray for our God of justice um, to, to be crying out and to be in the midst of those who are protesting. And of course, to bring peace as well where there are protests, but to bring just that powerful, prophetic moments of breakthrough where there's just a revelation of what's going on. Like when those police kneeled before those protesters and and there's that breakthrough and reconciliation. That's what we want to see, the kingdom of God to break in in the midst of this. So let's lift our voices for that this morning. Yeah, Lord, we pray for breakthrough in the name of Jesus who brings breakthrough, who brings resurrection out of death, um, who shines light into the darkness. Father God, we pray um, for those who have suffered oppression and injustice and discrimination. Lord, we pray freedom in the name of Jesus. We pray that we would live in a society that brings freedom. We pray we live in a society that lifts up the lowly and brings down the proud, Lord God, and, and demonstrates your values, Jesus. And I pray as a church, God, um, we could stand together, Lord, reconciled every tribe and tongue. Father, may we demonstrate 
what your desires for this world truly are, God. May, uh, may we demonstrate your heart for justice and righteousness, Father God. And may we stand with the oppressed and the fatherless and the widow and the orphan and the stranger. And Lord, those who we know from your word are on your heart, God. Um, Lord, thank you, God. Transform our hearts, renew our minds. Thank you, Lord. Make this world new, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God Thank you, Lord. and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you're close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness Of the goodness of 
God. Maybe you just want to sing of His goodness this morning. Just sing of His goodness as, as the Holy Spirit is moving in your hearts this morning. Let's just sing of His goodness. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we'll sing of Your goodness, Lord. We'll sing of Your goodness, Father. We'll sing of your goodness and mercy that follow us all our lives, Lord Jesus. Your grace knows no bounds. Your faithfulness lasts forever. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. come into a time of just uh, sharing the Lord's Supper together and, um, and it seems right with everything that we've been praying for, for our fellowship, um, with all that we've been praying for, for our world. Um, when we share this meal, it, it is a prophetic act. It's pointing towards what Christ has done and it's also eagerly awaiting the kingdom of God that will come. And we, we stand in the gap as Christians and as believers. Uh, we stand between these two events. And by the Spirit, um, we trust in our Lord Jesus. And, and we bring something of that future kingdom into the here and now. And we, we cry out to God, don't we? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just a little testimony, actually, um, this morning. We were planning on sharing communion and in the whole of uh, getting ready, it, it kind of slipped from my mind. And then just before the service, I saw that Kay, uh, and Kay will know this if she's watching, I saw that she'd done a, her Bible reading this morning. And so I went just to look at the passage. And it was this passage from Luke 22. And, you know, we're doing a New Testament in a year. So for those who are on it, You'll, you may have seen this passage. If you haven't, you'll see it later. But I'm going to read from it now. And it was just a wonderful reminder. I thought, oh, yes, you know, this is what God wants us to do this morning. And so Jesus and his disciples are making preparations for the Passover. And it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And so after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take and divide this among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. But the hand of him who's going to betray me is with me on the table. The Son of Man will go as it's been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And so this morning, as we come to share this meal together, it's a time for us to examine our hearts, actually, and to ask for forgiveness um, for where we have you know, turn from God's ways in our lives and come back to him and receive afresh this morning. So let's just take a moment to do that and just confess our sins to God. Thank you, Lord, that in all our failings, you are faithful, God, and that you're faithful to forgive us. And your love never fails and it perseveres. And you promise to complete the work you've begun in us. And we thank you, God, that we can come to this table because of your grace, not because we've earned it, not because of anything we've done, but because of the grace that's been given to us in Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate today. Thank you, Lord, that we can know freedom and forgiveness for all our sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord, we thank you for this bread and this wine and what they what they mean and what they symbolize and their significance, God. And we pray that this morning as we share them in our homes, whether we're on our own, um, Lord, we're not on our own because you're there with us, or Lord, whether we're in our families or as couples, Lord God, may we know that that binding 
power of the Holy Spirit that surrounds us all as a family at this time. And, uh, and that grace of the Lord that enables us to come to this table and receive. Amen. So if you're on your own this morning, then, um, then join us as we serve one another. And if you're in a family, just take this time just to serve one another and, and pray a blessing over one another as you do it. Um, but let's, um, let's share this meal together. The body of the Lord Jesus was given for you. And the blood of Jesus was shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can be healed, restored, forgiven and set free. Father, we thank you that as the Apostle Paul says, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Jesus, we anticipate the day when you will return. And Lord, we know that in every generation it is imminent, it is soon. And we are called to be faithful disciples and we're called to be faithful witnesses in our community, Lord. For we do not know the time or the hour. Um, but Lord, we look forward to it and we eagerly await it. And Lord, just as you eagerly awaited to eat that meal with your disciples, we eagerly await to share in that marriage supper of the Lamb, in that fulfilment that will come. And in the time being, Lord, help us to bring your kingdom here on earth, your kingdom of justice and righteousness and peace and love and joy and hope. Father, thank you for the hope that is ours. Lord, may it overflow to our community and to our world by the power of the Holy Spirit who is at work within us and does more than we could ever ask or imagine. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going we're gonna to sing just one more song. Um, and um, in fact, do you know what? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to play a video of testimonies, actually, because, you know, we want to hear of what God's been doing in the lives of our family. So let's, let's go to that. And, and if God's laying things on your heart this morning, then do message in and we'll share some of those things in just a moment. But for now, let's celebrate the things that God's been doing among our church family. I'm thankful to God to give, for giving us this time to get closer to him as a family and as a church and also giving us this time to trust him more and get cl and pray to him more that will, this will be over soon. Amen. Our Lord works in an amazing way and as you know it's been a journey with young Kudakwashe. Some of you know the story, some of you don't know the story but to those who know the story who do you think would win if Kudakwashe and myself would have a race? Check out the next video to see if your answer is correct. Guys, run! 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 Run, Daddy! Run, Daddy! Come on, son! Yeah! Kudakwashe! Yeah! Down in my heart, I love a father. Deep down in my heart, talking about a deep, deep down, down, deep down in my heart. I love your spirit. Deep down in my heart, talking about a deep, deep down, down, deep down in my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't that amazing? Isn't it just wonderful to see the 
things that God is doing in our children across church life um, and, and the way he's moving in their hearts and their lives and their families. Do you know, actually, I should have said at the beginning, if you have children up to maybe the age of 11, around that, then, um, then they might be watching with you at the moment. But we've also got uh, a whole playlist of things for them to um, to enjoy and to learn and to grow through and to draw closer to Jesus. So that's available on our YouTube um, channel and the playlists. And if you click on the actual playlist, then all the videos will then play in order. So um, do do check that out um, if you have children. And, and we've had some messages in. People um, who love to see Ron this morning and found that such an encouragement and, um, and it's brilliant. And actually then um, we had really encouraging messages actually uh, of people giving thanks for, um, for church leaders, including Ron and others. And um, and just saying prayers for us too. We really thank you for that. We do need your prayers um, and we really appreciate your prayers and we know the difference that your prayers are making in our lives as God um, moves and graciously answers those. Um, I think we're gonna, we are going to sing one more song before um, the word this morning and we're going to sing Blessed Be Your Name because it just starts with that line, every blessing you pour out, God, I'll turn back to praise. And so this morning, whatever you're feeling thankful for, um, whatever blessings God's poured out to you, now's the time. Let's praise Him for it. Let's praise Him for the testimonies we've seen. Let's praise Him um, for His faithfulness in our lives. Uh, let's give thanks to our God for His goodness. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, or walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Yeah, thank you, Lord, that our hearts can praise you, Lord, wherever we find ourselves this morning. And Lord, we can join in the worship of heaven. And Lord, we can join in the worship that will go on for all eternity, Lord God. And we can know the presence of your spirit in the midst of it. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to turn um, in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. If you've got Bibles or if you've got a Bible app and you can turn the Bible on without losing the live stream, um, in which case you're more technologically advanced than most of us, so well done. Um, and we're going we're gonna to read this passage. We're coming up to the end of our um, series in Philippians, the last chapter, and yet there's so much uh, yet to come in it at the same time. So let's read together from Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sintke to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Well, Paul is coming into land here. I don't know if you've ever heard a preacher use that expression in a sermon before. Often it means that just as you think things are coming to a close, there's a load of extra things crammed in for good measure. And that's kind of what Paul's doing. You know, there's so much in this closing passage of Philippians that, you know, we could split it up and go over it over probably six weeks, but we're not going to do that. We've got it just in two chunks, really. But even in these first nine verses, there is a huge amount to take on board. You know, remember, Paul is writing from prison to this church in Philippi that he loves. And his primary concern, which we saw in that first chapter, um, you know, in those first weeks, and we'll be revisiting this morning, is that they stand firm together in the Lord. That they know the joy of the Lord in their lives and that they press forward as a church in their trials. So his closing thoughts here are really significant and Paul doesn't want to miss anything. And as we said, he wants them to stand firm. This church that he's planted, this church that gives him such great joy, as we've read. This is the big therefore of the whole letter in verse 1. When Paul says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. We can see again this deep affection which Paul started the letter with. You know, it's all there. He calls them brothers and sisters, dear friends, those whom I love and long for. He says there is joy in his crown. You know, this word for crown, it's like the winner's medal at the Olympic Games. You know, that's where it came from. You know, the Greek games were a huge thing. And, um, and Paul loves his sporting metaphors, as we've said before. And he's saying that you Philippians, you're like a gold medal around my neck. You know, and Paul often refers to his 
disciples and churches in this way. We might find it um, unusual language, but it's very normal for Paul. 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter, um, verse 19, for instance. For what is our hope, our, cr- our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. This is the glory of entering into the fullness of God's kingdom and his presence when Jesus comes again and seeing all of those in whose lives you've played a part there with you. It's the joy of discipleship. You know, this is the the end goal, if you like. The reward is not some payoff or some other treasure that Paul is laboring for. It is the Philippians themselves. Uh, If you don't get this, it's a bit like raising children. Okay, you know, what is the reward for raising children? It's, it's the children themselves. You know, I'm sorry if you're expecting something else, but it is them. Uh, they are the reward. And Paul wants to ensure his children stand firm in the Lord. And this takes us back, doesn't it? You know, or it should do. It takes us back to chapter one. It reminds us of these opening words, this, this whole thesis statement of Paul's letter, if you like, that he makes in chapter one, verse 27, when he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Now, Paul gets specific at this point on how they are to stand firm. In fact, it seems there's a situation that has been on his mind throughout the whole letter, and now he addresses it head on. Yodia and Syntyche, these two women he mentions, he says, Yodia and Syntyche, you've got to put this falling out behind you, and you've got to be of the same mind. Now, why is this situation between these two women so important? Well, given Paul's repeated instruction to the church to stand firm, And this term, stand firm, it's like a military instruction, if you like. It's it's standing shoulder to shoulder on the front line. It's it's digging your heels in. It's not seeding any ground. It's holding your nerve, um, you know, in the face of opposition. You know, don't retreat, Paul's saying. But Paul clearly could see serious problems for the church unless this dispute was sorted. And it's so often the case. You know, I imagine you might have had some factions forming in the church around these two women. Two camps, which side are you going to take? And it's the sort of situation that can cause great damage to churches. It can cause churches literally to split in two. And most importantly, it causes huge damage to the witness of the gospel. And Jesus said, by this are people to know, the world is to know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So Paul's saying that this cannot be allowed to continue. It cannot happen. You've got to sort it out. You're not at liberty to have these kind of divisions and arguments in the people of God. You know, you can't indulge yourselves in this way. You've you've got to sort it out. But notice what Paul doesn't do at this point. Paul doesn't bring up the disputes or the details surrounding it. And doubtless, I think, he, he has heard about this from Epaphroditus when Epaphroditus came to see him. That's why he's writing to them about it. But instead, he calls them to be of the same mind. This phrase could be translated, have the same goal. And the goal is Jesus. We read that in chapter three, didn't, didn't we? You know, he's saying, remember, you have the same goal. You've got the same object, objective. You want the same things. Yeah, your approach is going to be different. You're going to have disagreements at times, but keep the main thing, the main thing. You know, sometimes we forget about that, don't we, in church life? But Paul, the other thing Paul doesn't do, he doesn't take sides. Okay, it would be the most unhelpful thing he could possibly do. It would only exacerbate the situation. Instead, Paul honours both women. Okay, he says, they've contended at my side. They're co-workers with me. Their names are written in the book of life. You know, in one sense, he's saying, come on, come on, guys. You're going to have to spend all eternity together. You may as well sort out the dispute now. Another thing Paul doesn't do. He doesn't sweep it under the carpet. In fact, he calls it out in plain view of everyone. You know, now remember, he honours them as he does this, but this is a bold move. It's quite a risky move to do this, actually. But, you know, there's going to be conflict in life, and the church is no exception. You're going to disagree. Times will come 
when relationships are going to be strained, no matter how godly you are. And churches can be very bad at handling conflict because we think that there should never be any conflict at all. And actually, conflicts are part of life. But what we need is we need Pauls. We need people like Paul who are not afraid to call it out in a loving, honouring way, but who are not afraid to confront the issue at hand. And we also need others to help, to come and mediate, perhaps. Paul says, I ask you, my true companion, to help these women. That's what he says. You know, he's saying, don't just stand back. Don't just listen to their moaning, perhaps, about the other one. Don't be complicit in division in the church. You know, don't take sides, but actually help them. Help them both. This true companion who Paul's referring to it might well be Epaphroditus who's bringing this letter back to the Philippians from Paul. And there's a very clear message here that is so different to the way that a lot of us are tempted to handle conflict in our lives and maybe particularly even in church life. Paul's saying deal with the problem. Don't bolt. Don't run away. You know, some people will just move from one relationship to another when things get tough, one friendship group to another, you know, one church to another even. And this is not what God's made you for. God wants you to be rooted. He wants there to be family relationships and deep connection. He knows this pulling apart that can happen when there's separation. He knows the pain of that. And he wants us to grow in maturity as we work through issues and grow in grace. You know, this doesn't mean that there aren't times when we have to go our separate ways. There can be unhealthy situations, perhaps, that we really should not stay in. But it doesn't mean that we haven't made every effort to put things right. Paul doesn't say they need to be best friends, although they are called to love one another. But what he's saying is you've got to be intent on the same goal. And can I also add here... Some have grown up with a horrendously individualistic approach to faith, which says that if someone disagrees with you or falls out with you, then it's like they are the enemy. OK, it's almost like they've been sent by the devil himself just to get at you. And, um, and this view of this way of thinking says that God's on your side, you know, and he's going to fight against that person and they're going to get what's coming to them and you're going to be vindicated. And this is such a distorted reading of Scripture. You know, it's such a distorted view of God. It is a misapplication of verses. You know, sometimes verses from the Psalms, you know, about David and his very real enemies. You know, and it, it turns God into our personal God. You know, our family God, our tribal God, the God who's on our side. It's an ugly view, right? And, and if we've ever had this, which many of us will have had perhaps at some point, we've got to, we've got to grow out of this. We've got to repent. We've got to change our way of thinking. Because God is bigger than that. He is too big to be on your side. You've got to be on his side. And, and in fact, if you think in this way, then probably the biggest problem in the conflict you're facing is you and is your mindset. You know, this is why Paul is saying to them, be of the same mind. You've got the same goal. You know, that other person, they're not the enemy. God loves Yodia and Syntyche. He doesn't love one or the other. He's not fighting the red corner or the blue corner. You know, God is fighting for reconciliation and the bonds of peace and grace and love among his people. And, and so should you. That's what Paul's saying. Because it's got to be all about Jesus. It's not about us. Paul goes on from this, again, with more parting advice as to how we are to stand firm. And it's connected in many ways. He says, rejoice in the Lord. You know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. It's a really important command. Now, Paul repeats it. Rejoice always. How, Paul, we might ask. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. People are, people are dying every day. We are surrounded by crisis and tragedy and heartbreak. We've spoken of some of it this morning. How can we rejoice always? And Paul says, yes. Yeah, I get that. But your joy should not be dependent on your circumstances or surroundings. It's dependent on the Lord. It is in him that we rejoice We've said this before as we've gone through this letter. Paul is in prison. Paul is about, you know, potentially about to be killed for his faith. But yet he can write this. And so when Paul writes this, we really should listen. 
And we shouldn't try and make up excuses as to why this doesn't apply to us and why we can sidestep it. It is a command. The word used here for rejoice, it can also mean celebrate. And it's really about celebrating together, actually. It's not necessarily something totally personal. It's linked to worship. And as we've said, you might think it's an unreasonable command, an unrealistic command, perhaps. But if you do, then think about how often you choose deliberately not to rejoice when you actually make that choice. Because it's easy to allow things to get to us, to choose to be grumpy, to choose to be miserable about, miserable about something. You know, I do this often. You've just got to ask Izzy. OK, she'll, she'll tell you. You know, some people spend their life looking for reasons to not rejoice. You know, they actually kind of, it's a twisted form of self-indulgence, if you like. We glory in our right to be miserable about everything. And our expectations can become all important. And when they are not met, which they rarely are, well, you know, let me tell you, I'm going to, I have a right to be grumpy about that. And you're not going to glorify God with that attitude. You are not going to worship God with that attitude. God's agenda is not based around your expectations. Get your soul happy in God. We looked at this in the, in the first week, I think. You know, we mentioned George Muller, the Victorian Christian philanthropist, the guy who, who, who ran the orphanage, who cared for so many people. And he said the most important task of every day for him was to get his soul happy in God before he did anything else. You know, in other words, to find his joy in the Lord um, because from that place, he could glorify and serve God and serve others. But until he'd done that, he couldn't. We move on. Let your gentleness be evident to all, Paul says. You know, the word for gentleness here means to be considerate. Everyone should see the result of Christ's work in you. This joy-filled life that you have in him. It should overflow in kindness and gentleness and consideration towards others. You know, when we're miserable, we're generally thinking about ourselves a bit too much. Not always, but often. And when we're joyful, again, sometimes we might be indulging in ourselves, but more often we're actually better placed to have the capacity to show concern and consideration for others, to let our gentleness be evident to all. So how do we actually rejoice always? Well, Paul goes on and he gives us some more advice here. He says, don't be anxious about anything. It's easy, right? You know, we live in the most anxious generation, um, possibly the most anxious generation the world's ever seen. We, we're living in the most anxious times in living memory for many of us. And Paul's writing to the Philippians. They surely lived in anxious times under this Roman occupation, which as Christians was not good news. And yet Paul's word to them and Paul's word to us is don't be. Don't be anxious. In fact, don't be anxious about anything at all, even if it's something you think you have really good cause to be anxious about. If you're a follower of Jesus, then actually to be anxious is to have a divided mind. And I'm not talking so much about diagnosed anxiety as a condition, which is more complex, um, although some of this might apply and, and you can decide what might apply to your situation if that's you. But generally speaking, anxiety pulls you in different directions. You know, part of the meaning of the Greek word here for anxious, it means to be distracted. Now think about the story of Martha and Mary in Luke 10. But Jesus visits um, the home of Mary and she sits in worship at Jesus' feet. You know, it's where she wants to be. But then Martha is distracted and she is rushing around and she's anxious about you know, getting everything ready and getting the preparations ready. She doesn't want to burn the food. She wants to make everything sure everything's just right. But this distracted, anxious state she was in caused her to complain about her sister. You know, she was moaning. In fact, she was moaning to the Lord too. The, the point is, Mary wasn't doing anything wrong at all. In fact, she got it right. Um, but it was Martha's attitude that was the problem. There we go. Jonathan has 
got it up on screen for us remotely. That's wonderful. So you can see it there. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. You might say in your translation, you're distracted by many things. But he said, actually, what Mary has here is better. You know, Paul is saying, when my priorities are wrong and I don't rejoice in the Lord and I start looking for joy in all kinds of other places, I get distracted. And when I get distracted, I start getting pulled in different directions and I'm double minded and I stop treating people with gentleness and consideration in those times. You know, I start moaning about people and I start having a go at others because I'm distracted and I'm anxious and frustrated. And actually, I'm the one who's in the wrong in those times. You know, I stop trusting and I start fretting, to put it a different way. I don't know about you. I've seen so much fretting in lockdown. I've seen people complaining about others more than ever. And actually, I've seen a lot of Christians do this too. And I know it's people's anxiety coming into play. And and that's really important to remember. When someone says something horrible to you um, or something that seems a bit sharp, often it's a projection of what's going on inside of them. And we've got to be gracious and loving. But I've seen pictures on social media that people have put up of friends together and then seen in the comments people jumping upon them and saying, you know, why aren't you social distancing? Only to find out that picture was taken two years ago. And the people in these instances, they're anxious. But what it's doing is it's robbing them of their ability to see clearly. And it's robbing them of their joy in the Lord. And it's causing them even to mistreat others if they're not too careful. You know, my anxiety in the home will have a negative effect on my family, as will yours. If I'm really anxious, I'm not that likely to be gracious and kind that much. And, you know, most of the stuff that we worry about, it never actually happens. That's true, isn't it? You know, the things that keep you up at night are never as bad as you think they are. There was a story of a woman who worried for 40 years that she was going to die of cancer And when she eventually died at the age of 70, she died of pneumonia. She'd spent 40 years worried about the wrong thing. You know, someone else once said, worry's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. So what's the solution? Let's see if this comes up. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything in verse 6, but pray about Everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You know, don't try and take control of situations that are actually out of your control. And and that applies to most situations. We're finding that out in this time, aren't we? But that's the root of our worry. We take control of things that we don't have control over. Don't stay up all night thinking about these things as they get bigger and bigger and more preposterously out of proportion But pray about these things and give them to God. And it's not always easy. But the point is God is more than big enough to be able to handle them. You know, we have a father in heaven who cares for us. And it just so happens he's also the almighty God of the universe. And that's really good news for us. When you're anxious, pray. When you're tempted to worry, pray. Invite God into that place of worry too. Don't shut him out of it. Allow him to Take over and transform that place and shine his light. You know, faith is the cure for fretting. We pray about everything with thanksgiving because gratitude is a launch pad for joy, isn't it? It helps us worship. We, we thought about that this morning. It focuses us on how good our God is. But what happens when we pray? Paul tells us the peace of God which transcends or surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. You might know this verse well, and if you don't, it's a great one to commit to memory. But when the Philippians heard this term for guard, which was phrase, they would think of this garrison of Roman soldiers that were guarding Philippi. And we've said Philippi was a colony of Rome. And so there's all of these soldiers and they're standing guard and they're stopping enemies from invading and they're keeping the city safe. And Paul is saying the peace of God garrisons our heart and our mind. It protects from enemy attack and infiltration. If you've ever experienced this transcendent, peace of God in your life, you will know that it overwhelms everything else. It is far more powerful than your anxiety and your worry. It's pervasive. It's awesome. 
And it can seem as if there's no opportunity for worry to sneak in. And Paul's saying this should be our experience in prayer. You know, may you know that experience today if you desperately need it. And then finally, Paul redirects our thought life in verse 8. It's to help us stand firm, to rejoice, to banish anxiety and experience God's peace. You know, if you want to celebrate, you, you know, you need something to celebrate. And what Paul is saying is actually there's plenty of things that you have to celebrate. Primarily Jesus himself, but many other good things that come about because of him. Let's have a look at these verses in verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely... Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. The word for think upon is this Greek word logitsomai. And it means to meditate on or to chew over or to ruminate, um, to ponder. The Psalms, they speak about meditating on the word of God. And that's the kind of thing that Paul has in mind here. Psalm 1 that we've got up on the screen, it speaks of the person who meditates on the word of God day and night. It says that person's like a tree planted by streams of water. You know, they are rooted and that plant yields its fruit in season. They're fruitful and their leaf doesn't wither and whatever they do prospers. You know, this is not the psalmist's account of a life of strife or anxiety. It is the psalmist's account of a joy-filled life. And let me just say here also, there's a huge difference between Eastern meditation and Hebrew meditation. Okay, And you need to know this. You need to be discerning in your life too when you think about these things. You know, Eastern meditation is about empty in your mind, whereas Hebrew meditation and Christian meditation is about filling your mind. It's not just about getting toxic thoughts out. It's about getting life-giving, healing thoughts in. And that is really important. And Paul gives us a list here. He says, whatever's true. You know, the problem with half of the things we worry about, as we've already said, is they're not true, are they? We fill our minds at times with misconceptions, you know, sometimes misconceptions about other people. Perhaps that was Yodio and Syntyche's problem. We blow things out of proportion at times. We can turn other people into monsters just because our thoughts run away with us. Paul says, think about whatever is actually true. And that's why we need to read scripture as well. You know, we should read it every day because we, when we do so, we're filling our minds with truth. Think about how much time you spend on things like social media and TV and all these other things, right, which, which can be good. And then think about how much time you spend in the word of God and ask yourself the question, what is having the primary formative role in my life? What is actually informing my thoughts the most? I, I think a lot of us will be surprised when we think about it. He says, whatever's noble, and this term here, it has behaviour in mind. And, and whatever's right, whatever's just and fair. In fact, all the language here, as Paul goes on, is reminiscent of Eden, the garden. And Paul te is telling us, meditate on and chew over what is of God's kingdom. And, and don't fill your mind with things that are of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdoms of this world. You know, fill, that, fill your mind with the things of God to see the beauty in the world that he's given. And that doesn't mean, by the way, bury your head in the sand. Okay, There are times, like in the last week, where we have to face up to and call out injustice and, and face up to systemic issues in our world and speak against the evils of racism and discrimination. And, you know, the church is called to have a prophetic voice, which means we have to be aware and we have to know what's on God's heart and how to speak into these things. And at the same time, realise our own need for transformation and repentance. But Paul is saying, don't fill your mind with everything that's wrong with the world. You know, and that's hard in a 24-7 news culture, isn't it? But Paul's saying, rather, fill your mind with good things. He mentions pure things, you know, and that means not mixed with sin. You know, don't go into the realms of fantasy, uh, perhaps lustful thoughts, you know, fill your mind with lovely things, not, not bitterness and unforgiveness. On this one, I don't know if you've ever found yourself replaying something in your mind that happened to you. You know, reliving emotions, possibly rehearsing what you wished you'd done in a situation. You know, I wish I'd said that. I wish I'd done that. 
you know, I wish I'd given that person the right hand of fellowship in that situation or fivefold ministry or whatever we want to say. This is not healthy. You know, we need to be set free from that brokenness and the anger that we feel. And actually, you might need healing from that. You probably need to forgive. And when you find yourself doing that, it's really important. We take control and we fill our minds with what's good. And, you know, possibly we take those things to God in prayer for him to deal with them. We might need help from others as well in those situations if we can't do it alone. But in summary, Paul's saying, be filled with things that are praiseworthy, that cause your hearts to be filled with joy and turn to God in worship and thanksgiving. And that's a key to celebration and rejoicing. Celebration is the language of worship. It's a language that honours God. Complaining, moaning, grumbling, whining, it's the language of the accuser. It's there to sidetrack your heart. It's there to lead you into bitterness and resentment. What language do you speak? And we're coming into land now. You know, really we are. You know, I don't just mean that. That's not preacher speak. We, we're looking out. We can see the tarmac and we're about to feel those wheels bump onto the ground. Okay. But Paul is calling the Philippians and us to change our way of thinking, which is another way of saying repent. You know, this Greek word metanoia, Um, from which we get repentance. It's not an austere religious term. It just means change your mind, change your way of thinking, change your whole worldview, your way of looking at the world. It's far more than about stopping sinning, but that's a key part of it. It's about saying, actually, transform the whole way you look at everything and the desires of your hearts. And he's saying our worldview needs to be rooted in the Lord as we stand firm in him. Stand firm in Jesus. Our thinking needs to be in line with our faith. So what starts in your brain ends up affecting your heart and your emotions and eventually ends up in the soul. And Paul's saying, don't let your soul be darkened. Don't allow your thoughts to run away with you and rob you of peace and joy. Stand firm in the Lord. You were once in darkness, but now God in his grace has brought you into his kingdom of light. So live as children of light. How are we going to respond this morning? Well, the first thing I want you to know is know that God wants you to have peace and joy this day. That's what God wants for you, wherever you are and wherever you find yourself. Whatever the situations of your life that have led you to feel like you're feeling this morning, however that is, God wants you to have peace and joy. But that means choosing Jesus and his way and being obedient to his word. So let's pray. And as we do so, I just want to invite you to close your eyes if you find it helpful. I'm going to ask you a few questions just to help you to reflect and think about what God wants for you. Let's pray. And just as you, just as you're reflecting and, and, and just invite God just to come and work in you and invite the Holy Spirit to come and work in your heart. And just think, is there a conflict you need to resolve? Maybe there's something that you need to just stop stirring. Uh, Maybe there's things you've been saying or listening to others say that are unhelpful. And now's a time just open-handedly to give those things to God. Do you focus on negative things? Are there times you actively choose not to celebrate? Maybe you're doing that this morning. Do you choose to live in a bubble of misery and darkness and complaining? It might be a cry for attention, but actually it's killing your soul. And you've got to let God in. You know, now's the time to repent, to change your way of thinking and to actively choose joy and to tell God that's the decision you're making. Are you anxious this morning about something or or many things or everything? You know, and if that's diagnosed, maybe you just need a touch of healing from God in that or need to know that he's with you. But now is a time to pray. Now's a time to pray about everything that's worrying you. And maybe just to pray about anxiety itself. And make sure you give thanks at the time at the same time too. And finally, are there thoughts that swirl around in your mind that aren't helpful? You know, maybe critical thoughts about your brother and sister, anger and bitterness, fantasies. Maybe you rehearse those situations from your past round and round. And now again is a time to Repent and change your way of thinking and to fill your mind with the things that Paul speaks of here. I'm going to pray 
Um, but remember, the prayer room is there and available too. Um, well, let me just pray for us. Father God, I just pray by your spirit now, would you renew and transform our minds, God? Would you help to bring our thinking in line with our faith in Jesus? Would you help us to invite him into every area of our lives? And if there's, a, if there's like a room or a space we've been shutting off from him, as it were, metaphorically speaking, Lord, we just want to open that space up to him now. And God, help us to find our joy in the Lord, Lord, no matter what we're going through. You know, whatever struggles we're facing, no matter how dark it is, Lord, let your light shine into our minds and help us to think about whatever's lovely and admirable and worthy and noble and praiseworthy, God. Um, Lord, help us where there is conflict to find healing and reconciliation in Jesus' name so that everything, every part of our lives glorifies you, God. Amen. So you said the prayer room, um, the prayer room is open and you can see those who are there waiting to pray for you. Um, so the link is there. You can make use of that. And um, We're going to sing one more song. I'm aware time is getting on this morning, um, but we're just going to sing a song to help us to respond. You can click into that link and go into the prayer room. If you do, you'll be put in the waiting room until they can assign someone to pray with you. So just be patient if you do that. Um, but please do take advantage of that this morning, especially if there's something specific that you know you've got to move on from and that you just need some help and people to stand with you and pray. Um, but we're going to sing this song. God is a good father. He wants you to have peace and joy in your life. Um, so let's sing this together. You are. 
am, is who I am, is who I am. Yes, Lord, we want to know your peace and your love and your joy in the power of your spirit, Lord, this morning. Lord, peace so unexplainable, Lord, that we can hardly think, Lord. But what we do want to think on is whatever's lovely, whatever's good, whatever's excellent, whatever's noble, whatever's worthy of praise. Lord, transform us by the renewing of your mind. Bless each one of us, Lord, to know the peace of God this day, guarding our hearts and our minds, standing guard, surrounding us, Lord, I pray that as your people at this time, we would know that your grace is lavished upon us. And Lord, I pray that we would know your joy so that we can be considerate of others, so that our hearts can go out to our communities. Lord, so that we can love those who have no peace and no joy and no hope. But Lord, that we can bring the hope we have in Jesus Christ to bear on their lives as your kingdom breaks in. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning uh, for the live stream. And um, and I just want to, yeah, let's just share this um, this verse. This is just a message in from one of our our street pastor teams. And they said they were able to go out um, on Friday night and God gave them this text from Psalm 3. And it said, Lord, you are a shield for me. Um, you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. And, and if you are struggling with ang- anxious thoughts this morning or anxiety, know that God is a shield for you. You know, as he said to Abraham, uh, as Abraham said to the Lord, you are my shield and you are my great reward. God is your shield. He is shielding you. Um, but please keep in touch with us. If you want to message us, if you've got any prayer requests, please do let us know. Please make use of the prayer room. It's still open. It will be open for a little while. You can use the link that's in the chat. Um, And if you want to know about more that's going on in the week and our our various catch-ups and different things we do, like our Facebook page for more information, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is somewhere down here, I believe, and and you can connect with us that way too. Um, But we've been really blessed to have you with us this morning and we're going to play out with the welcome video um, for those of you who maybe tuned in a little bit late give you a second chance to see it but um, may God bless you may you know his peace and his love surrounding you and your family and all those you love this week amen welcome welcome, welcome to, to church, church. welcome to church Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church.